So hi everybody, this is Hustle Hub. I'm Giacomo. Today we are with a special guest, Sylvia Manent. Uh, she has her own channel. She talks about uh, the best practices for personal finance and also some videos about uh, tips for financial professionals. So Sylvia, thank you for being with us. And let's tell us a bit about your background and what motivated you to start a YouTube channel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Giacomo, for having me here. As you know, I studied abroad in Italy, so it's nice to have like a fellow <laughs> Italian uh, interviewing me for your channel. So thank you for having me. Um, so just a quick little about myself. I am originally from Barcelona, Spain, and I studied finance in college. And what happened then, I went to work for these large banks. And recently, I started my own firm after working for Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley. And so the number one reason why I started my YouTube channel was to get myself in front of potential clients at the end of the day, right? It's I manage money. I have my own registered investment advisor and I manage money for people. So I thought, you know, let's create a YouTube channel and an Instagram and everything so that people can feel educated and before they get to know me. Um, so I started that. And once I started my channel, I started getting some questions about the CFA. So I started giving some career advice tips for people that were looking to break into finance or looking to get the CFA charter or the CFP or whatnot. So quick little background on why I started my channel, actually. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's tell us a bit more about your experiences and how you got into banking and what roles you covered into banking. Yes. So excellent job. So what happened was in 2011, my father retired and he sold his, his company. And right off the bat, he had a financial advisor, right? So he got, went with a financial advisor with like UBS and because I was too young and I started learning about finance through this financial advisor. It was a, it was two financial advisors and they were amazing. They taught me everything that I know today. And I, I thought I was going to go into marketing. I thought I was going to be, you know, selling beer for Heineken because that's what I wanted to do. I was like, yeah, I don't even drink beer. Like if anyone, like I don't even drink, but I thought that I, that's what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to go into marketing, but long story short, I think after my dad sold his firm, I realized that there was a completely different business and industry that I had never been exposed to. And it was absolutely fascinating to see how these financial advisors were uh, managing like, you know, my family and I just wanted to be like them, right? Like they would pull up with their Porsche and they looked super sharp and they had amazing shoes. And I honestly wanted to be like them. So long story short, I went to work for JP Morgan right after I realized that maybe finance was something I kind of wanted to do, even though I hated numbers and I hated like looking at financial statements. Um, and I went to work for JP Morgan and I worked for the Central America uh, desk, right? So I was working with two different financial advisors that worked with Central American clients and it was ultra high net worth. So people 50 million and up. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So Fast forward a few years later, I, you know, went into finance when I went to a Saudi business school in Barcelona, Spain, and decided to do an internship with Credit Suisse with the ultra high net worth Mexican desk at Credit Suisse in Zurich, Switzerland. So there I was working with high net worth clients and I absolutely loved it, right? Like I really enjoyed like catering to these incredible people that were so smart, so driven, so down to earth. So like, I was just amazed about how people could have so much money and still be so nice and still actually want my advice. Like I was just like, I was like, I'm only a 25 year old. I don't know anything. Um, and so I realized I was like, wow, I really like dealing with people. I love explaining what's happening in the markets. I love helping people really build their wealth. Um, and so long, what happened was after working for Credit Suisse for a few years, I went back to America where my family currently resides and worked with Morgan Stanley. 
And with Morgan Stanley, it was a little bit less. Um, and please interrupt me if I'm saying things like too much, but no, no. Morgan Stanley was a completely different clientele, right? It was not ultra high net worth. It was more high, like normal people. Um, and when I mean normal, I'm, I'm, look, I'm literally saying like next door, like anyone normal. Um, maybe they had like 500,000, a million, 2 million. I, I worked with a really wide range. Uh, but anyone with like 30 million was like really high. Um, and I was a financial planner. So basically I went in with the financial advisor and I created a strategy for the client to say, okay, you want to, you want to get married. You want to have kids. You want to like go on, get a boat X, Y, Z. And I was the one making the financial strategy to make that happen. Um, so then I always knew I wanted to start my own firm. And created my own firm in last year, right before the COVID crisis. Um, and like now I'm here because I wanted to be able to cater to a younger clientele as well. Okay. Okay. So um, can you tell us a bit more? Uh, what are the, what is the skill set that you need to have to deal with high net worth individuals and are uh, soft skills more important than technical skills in that field? Totally. So high net worth individuals are no different than normal, normal individuals, or um, typically they have, they can't even like a lot of them, no matter how much money they have, they, they still feel like it's maybe like they're going to run out of money. Right. So I realized that empathy was one of the most important skills for high net worth individuals. In addition, not assuming that they're extremely knowledgeable about the finance space, right? Because a lot of these, typically, if you're dealing with someone that's high net worth, they're going to be a business owner, right? Like that's typically the way to make big money in this world is to become your own, an entrepreneur. And typically these people were business owners, either in oil or technology, and they had no idea about the stock market. And so they were looking for guidance. And looking so in, in generally, they were looking to protect their wealth rather than grow their wealth. So in a, so we pretty much created portfolios that were set up in a way that we're going to stay rich and keep up with inflation, but that weren't going to have the high volatility that you get in a regular stock market portfolio. Okay, okay. So um, can you tell us a bit more how... Um the relationship were different from the ones you had in Credit Suisse compared to the ones you had in Morgan Stanley because you said uh, in Morgan Stanley you had, let's say, more normal people and in Credit Suisse you had very high net worth individuals. And what, what is the difference in the, in the day-to-day tasks that you need to have in a Morgan Stanley rather than Credit Suisse for the opportunities that you had? Totally. So high, ultra high net worth individuals. um, And I even do this with my clients, even if they're not ultra high net worth, they want a team. Like they want to know that number one, you're looking after their money. Number two, that you're looking after their kids or like their children, their legacy, and they want to be tax efficient, right? Like they have a lot of money and we're, we're, I'm, I'm working extremely closely with the CPA and the estate attorneys as a team. Right. So what we'll do, typically we'll have quarterly meetings with ultra high net worth clients with the CPA and the estate attorney and myself to try to to always be coordinated and work as a virtual family office. Right. Like you they want someone that knows all the aspects of their life. And they're at the end of the day, they're paying you as well to do like send the checks. Right. Like I was doing a lot when I was at Credit Suisse, a lot of my tasks were literally catering to the client. Like, let me send the ki- your child, you know, a $500,000 check so that he can buy the home. Or it was all more administrative. Um, and so, because at the end of the day, that's what they wanted, right? Like they wanted that white glove service. They wanted to be able to call you and say, move this money for me. Um, or, you know, they weren't calling me and saying, buy this stock. They were like, mostly it was more like admin and things like that. Whereas when I, and in addition, we didn't really create a financial plan. Like if you have $50 million and 
typically you're spending, I don't know, half a million a year. You don't really have a spending problem and you don't really need like a really detailed uh, financial plan that says, hey, can you afford a wedding? Can you afford a car, right? Like they're just want to know, hey, am I going to run out of money? Like that's what they care about. Whereas with more normal people, you have to be very strategic about how you use that money. Because if we're talking about one to $2 million and you want to buy a house or a wedding, like we need to be very strategic about how we're going to use those funds and make sure that we create a more uh, methodical, like budget intricacy, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So I was wondering how does these big companies find no clientele and how do they pitch no high net worth individuals to come and uh, invest with, for example, Credit Suisse or JP Morgan and so on? How do, how do they target them and how do they pitch them? Great question. So typically when you're at Morgan Stanley or Credit Suisse, obviously the, the firm will do their own digital marketing. They'll write blogs as a firm. But at the end of the day, clients are not calling Morgan Stanley or in, in general, right? Like someone that has a million or $2 million, they're not calling Morgan Stanley or Credit Suisse or whatever. They're calling a particular person that they may have heard of, right? It's And so typically financial advisors, when I was there, I had to market myself, right? I, I couldn't, I had to go out and cold call people and it was a numbers game, right? And as you know, now nobody's picking up the phone anymore because you're bothering me. Like when someone calls me, I'm like, unless you're my mom or my dad or my friend, like you're annoying me. Like you're, it's not on my time, right? So people, it's still very old school in the sense that, cold calling and trying to create like networking events, very, which obviously those work because people have made like that can work. But the problem, and this is why I went on my own, is that the world has become way more digital, younger, a lot of the the ultra high net worth, they have children and the children are the decision makers. And the children are not going to pick up the phone when they see an unknown number or, and it's like, or get a cold email, what they're going to do is either Google financial advisor in my area, or they may find a lot of my clients, they find me on search results on like directories, as well as Instagram, right? Because that's, and people assume, right, that Instagram is not for high net worth. That's so far from the truth. Like, not at all. Everyone's on Instagram. <laughs> like, okay. There's going to be high net worth people there and, and not high net worth people there. And you have to be creating content for them so that they feel like they know you before they call you, right? I don't want to cold call people. I want them to come to me after they resonate with my content. Okay, okay. So um, I was wondering, uh, you have the CFA, right? So uh, most people that I know that have the CFA are in portfolio management. So why... Do a private banker need a CFA? And why did you do that? Why did you have to struggle so much to get the CFA? And what what were the benefits of having that? So several reasons. The first reason is even though I'm like a forefront, investment management is really like the stock market um, and managing your wealth is really the key to building your wealth. And I've always wanted to be, and because I like the markets, I, I manage my own portfolios for clients, right? Um, I typically, and so we do custom and I wanted to be able to, you know, manage the money myself so that I was like, I went to the client and explained to them why the market was this way or that way, right? Like a lot of financial advisors, they're not managing the money. They have someone else manage it. And then they're like, they can't really be in charge of what's happening, right? Like, I don't, I could hire someone younger. And as I grow my firm, I do plan to hire a junior portfolio manager or junior advisor. Um, But I wanted to be able to manage the money myself. So I, so I, I was able to cater better. Number one, the second reason is I'm a woman and I'm a young woman and I don't have gray hair. Right. And I understood that. I understood that that can be seen as either a positive or a negative. Uh, I didn't have the 40, 50 years of experience that many of my competitors had. So I had to use the CFA as a tool to show clients, hey, I am committed to my work. I know my sh- myself 
because if you pass the CFA, you at least know, um, at least you have some like level, like minimum level. Um, and so I wanted to make them feel comfortable as someone that is still young um, and that, hey, I knew what I was doing. And so the CFA, um, so that's the second reason. And then the third reason, to be honest, because I wanted to be the, like, the best that I could be for my clients. Like, I know this is my career. I know this is what I want to be doing. And I want to, like, I think any of us, whenever we choose a career path, you really want to be the best in your field or the best. And the CFA was just an excuse for me to learn and be better. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh you're the only one thus far that, that i've interviewed that also has the cfp can you tell us a bit more what is the cfp and how that uh, differentiates from the cfa totally totally so the cfa is more for people that want to be managing portfolios and the problem is though i'm going to say i'm going to be radically honest that we are moving away from active management passive management the last especially five years how it's really being the outperforming of active management. And so I understood that the, the, the industry is shifting to a more less active and, and less hedge fundy type of job to more of like a buy and hold. So I knew that, you know, portfolio manager, at least right now, as I see it, may not be the best career from like a long-term perspective uh, because passive indexing has just, you know, vastly outperformed. So the CFP is different in the sense that it doesn't cater, it doesn't talk about investments, it talks about holistic financial planning. So we talk about taxes, estate planning, in a little bit of investment, a little bit of like education. So when the CFP is for people that want to be able to be a financial planner, right? Like that's exactly what I was doing at Morgan Stanley. I was creating financial strategies to see, okay, how can we optimize your education, your estate plan, so that we can create a strategy and a plan that's right for you. So the CFP is mostly for people in the United States, number one, and for people that may not be, don't want to be portfolio managers, but they want to be relationship managers, right? They want to be at the front and then maybe have someone who's a CFA charter manage the money. Um, I would, just to let you know, um, I've gotten more clients because I have the CFP than the CFA. Because the CFP board, especially in the United States, has done an amazing job of marketing. So clients know that if they want a financial advisor, that is the CFP is like the thing that you need to look for. So the CFP is becoming a like the gold standard for financial planning. And clients now with not education, they know that that's what they should be looking for. So I also purely do, did it as a marketing thing as well as an education thing because I wanted to cater to clients. Okay, okay. So you talked about um, um, the advantages of being members of these organizations and having these certificates. Can you tell us a bit more what are what are uh, the motivations why you should stay, for example, in the CFA society or and is there something uh, similar for the CFP and is it worth it? Yeah. So to be honest, I'm part of so many different organizations. Um, the CFA society, I'm, I mean, I'm part of like the society just because, you know, I pay my dues. I did attend some conferences um, and I still stay in touch with many of my fellow um, people, especially after starting your own firm. You need to be part of organizations and you want to be able to share ideas with other people that are better than you, right? So when I got my CFA charter, I met a lot of other professionals that were managing portfolios and I still, I'm in touch with them because I like to hear the perspective about the market. So for me, like that $120 that you have to pay per year is incredible for the network that you get, um, especially because you want to build your network before you need it, right? And so um, I think that, yes, the CFP also has it, but I'm always, I'm always looking to collaborate and meet other people of the CFA and the CFP, because at the end of the day, that's the people that are going to be able to partner with, help you. And who knows, maybe you want to create a merger. So. Okay. Okay. So, um, one question that I have is how hard it was to go on your own and what are the main, uh, let's say bureaucratic 
struggles of starting your own firm rather than staying, for example, in a Morgan Stanley? So I'm going to be honest. I Morgan Stanley was incredible to me. Credit Swiss was incredible. Like leaving those firms, especially when they bank in you, they 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 place their trust in you and they, you know, they want you to be a better person. I didn't really want to like deep down, I loved my coworkers. I loved my boss. Um, people treated me extremely well, both at those places, but I knew I needed to start my own firm just because the, the, the generation of thirties and forties, like they are like, I wanted to be digitally front. So that was driving me. And I also wanted to be a business owner because I knew really that was the key to building wealth, to be an investor, to be a business owner. Um, so it was a little bit hard. I did have a company that helped me called XYPN. Um, and they basically, um, I had a call with them and they drafted all my compliance documents because of compliance. And I couldn't leave. Like when I left Morgan Stanley, I had to be like not doing anything for two months while things were getting registered, um, which was a little bit annoying, especially because, you know, you wanted to get started and I wanted to market and I wanted to do things. So it's, if you're going to start your own firm, like understand how other people did it and find the right partner. So I used XYPN um, as a partner and like, you know, I couldn't have done it without them. And I also used Schwab as my custodian and they were very helpful in setting up my, like my, my, the accounts and everything like that. Okay. Okay. So can you tell us, can you tell us a bit more what is, what is the strategies that you have? Do you invest in singular stocks or do you invest something like ETFs, mutual funds and so on? Totally depends. So typically I do invest in individual stocks. Um, for larger clients, we do directly individual stocks just because I'm always trying to be as tax efficient as I can. Obviously ETFs, index ETFs are very tax efficient, but those are better. I do use ETFs. Uh, for my younger clientele that are just like starting out um, and, and building portfolios around that. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I do a little bit of both. I prefer to do single stocks because that way I can con completely control the portfolio and I can say why each position, why we have every position and why I have conviction. Okay. Whereas okay. With ETFs, I don't, I don't have that control. So I have like my flagship portfolios that we put clients in. Um, and we cater and we customize it a little bit to them as well. Okay, okay. So um, another curiosity that I have for uh, people that want to get into finance is how work-life balance is in private banking because everybody cares about investment banking, work-life balance, and um, it's hard to hear from people in private banking. How is that and how does that compare to, for example, investment banking or portfolio management? Totally. So the, here's the thing about work-life balance, right? If you're going to be an assistant for a financial advisor at a private bank, probably your work-life balance is good, right? You get in at nine, you leave at six or seven. When I was at Credit Suisse, I would get in at eight, had two hours for lunch and then left at seven. So it was a little bit longer, but I did have like a two hour lunch break uh, where we could go to the gym and what have you. Um, and also, this, is in, this was in Switzerland, right? In Switzerland. Is, it, is it the same for Credit Suisse in, in America from what you heard or not? Um, so here's, here's the thing. When you're in private banking, you have goals that you have to attain. You have to bring X amount of money every single year or you get fired. And at the end of the day, um, if you don't like catch a fish, you don't eat, right? So whereas in investment banking, you're working, you're, you're kind of working for a team and someone else. When you're in private banking as a financial advisor, you're working for yourself and you have these quotas that you have to meet, right? It's either a couple million. It depends on which firm you are, but typically you'll see anything between five to 10 million a year and you have to bring that money in and you have monthly goals. So at the end of the day, if you have to stay in the office later to be able to make more calls, that's what people are going to do. When I was in private banking, people were working weekends and late nights. Uh, but that's because they were financial advisors. They weren't like assistants or part of a team. So if you are in a role where you're going to bring money in, you are going to work late. But here's the thing about private banking is that 
Um, if you can try to get clients that are in the same age as you and you can grow with them, it's just an incredible, it's very, it's a very like beautiful um, career, right? Because you're with the client throughout their ups and downs. Whereas, and so that's what I really liked about it. Whereas in investment banking, you're kind of working for someone else. In private banking, you're like your own entrepreneur within a large organization. Okay. So if you get more clients, you make more money, right? If Okay, okay. So um, we talked about work-life balance. How, is the, how are the salaries structured in private banking? Are they more uh, bonus-driven uh, compared to other, other um, branches of, of a bank? Totally. Okay, so in Switzerland, we had just salaries, right? Um, and it was a fixed salary and you were a relationship manager and you would cater to a couple of clients, um, or like, you know, whatever, um, as a team. So that was structured as a salary when in the United States, it's more structured as a, as like a ladder, right? So you start with a salary and then every single, either the first year you start with a salary, the second year, the salary gets cut in half because you're supposed to be making money off of the eight like the clients that you brought in for like the net the following three years okay. so after after three years the salary is if you got say that you're managing a hundred million dollars and you charge one percent you know that means you're making a million dollars a year um off of because you've caught right so the salary at the end of the day if the it's an aum model so Whereas like in Switzerland, it was more like a salary based job. So you have that safety, but you don't have that upside potential that you could at a Morgan Stanley in the United States or, you know, a Merrill Lynch. Okay. Okay. And okay. So uh, I was just wondering how is um, working in Switzerland? What are the pros and cons of working in Europe in Europe? And you, you had your experience in Switzerland and how does that change? In, in the US, what are the pros and cons that you had in one place that you didn't have in the other and vice versa? Okay, so in Switzerland, I really liked that the pros were, it was a very team oriented approach, right? Like we were all catering to the ultra high net worth as a team and nobody was really competing with each other. We really cared about making Credit Suisse more money, right? So it was a very team oriented approach. Um, and I love that. Like I'm team oriented. I like to work in, with people. Um, and I really, really like that about, you know, Morgan, um, Credit Suisse. Um, the, another, I would say, so that was like the main pro, um, the con, the pro could be, it could be a pro for some people or a con you have a fixed salary and you have like a safe job, but it's hard for you to make more money, like make the money that you could in the United States, for example. And I'm just generalizing in general, but um, because the United States is more meritocracy, whereas Switzerland is more like salary based. So those are like pros. The cons, I would say, is um, in general, the systems, right? So in the U.S., you have a low zero base commissions, very low cost brokerage, many ETFs that are low cost. So it's more tax, it's more efficient to invest in the U.S., than it is to invest in Europe. I mean, now obviously Europe is becoming like better and everything, but um, there is not as many ETFs and many investments for Europeans as they are with US Americans or, or clients in the US. So typically having ETFs that are not, um, that are low cost, you're not gonna find as much of that in Europe, in Switzerland. Um, then the the pros I would say about the U.S. is obviously the low cost brokerage and how for the client it's it's better because, you know, more money in their pocket. The cons is that it wasn't a team oriented approach. And a lot of the times it's it's one of those places in the U.S. If you're not hungry, people are so much like there's so many incredible people. I mean, even my competitors, right? Like um, there's so many great people. It's a very competitive aspect. And if you make it in the, they say, right, if you can make it in the U.S., you can make it anywhere. Um, but th those are a little bit like the pros and cons, I would say. Okay, okay. So um, I was wondering, so 
online, we can, it's probably quite easy to find how recruitment processes work in investment banking or in consulting and so on. How is that in private banking? What are they looking for? And what are, what are the skill set that you need to have before getting hired? Totally. So you don't have to have like more technical skill set, right? Like when you get hired, if you look at what these companies are looking for financial advisors, if you look at a job posting, basically it will state charismatic, someone who can talk to clients, someone who can bring in money, right? Like they want to, they want you to be a salesperson, right? Like that's, they want you to be able to schmooze people into getting their money. Whereas with investment banking, they want to know that you can do a discounted cash flow model and that you can do like a DCF. But here's the thing about investment banking, and I've even noticed this with my own partner, that you're someone that um, it's you're a lot less, um, you're less, I would say, care like not not obviously people are charismatic, but you don't need to be charismatic in investment banking. You just need to be able to do your numbers and do your work well. In private banking, if you can't talk to people, if you cannot talk to strangers, if you cannot calm people when there's a stock market collapse, you're not going to do well, right? Because at the end of the day, people care about the relationship with you. Obviously, they want they want they want to hire a financial advisor because they know what they're doing, but they want to hire someone that like is a pleasure to work with. Um, so those are more of the skills that they're looking for: someone that is charismatic um, and smart, but but typically someone who can sell well is what they're looking for because they care about the money coming in. Okay. Okay. So um, are there any extracurricular activities that uh, could help you out in a recruitment process for private banking? So to be honest, uh, it's, if you can sell like lemonade, right? Like they will like that. Like if you can say to a recruiter, I used to sell Pokemon cards on eBay, or I was, I was selling something, whatever has to do with sales and being in front of a customer, they're going to like that. Because if you can sell ice to the Eskimos, like you can sell anything. Right. And so for you, I would like for people that want to break into private banking, I would hone in on how to influence people, make friends, like definitely read the book, how to make friends and influence people. Um, and any like, it's, it should be about sales, right? And to be honest, in life, if you're going to start your own company, like say that you want to do private banking now, but maybe you want to have be an entrepreneur, you need sales skills, like sales skills, right? Like if you can't sell to clients, if you cannot recruit money, you're going to completely fail like most clients and most entrepreneurs. So I would say hone in on your sales skills. And honestly, it's really sad because that's not something that business schools do when I was at Asave, sales was an extracurricular. It was an optional course. It should be required at every single business school for you to know how to sell, sell to people, for you to be able to cater to people, for you to be able to to service people. Like those are must skills for every single job that you would ever get, but especially for business owner and for a private banker. Okay. Okay. So. Are there any technical tools that you need to master? For example, in investment banking, of course, you need to master Excel and so on. In portfolio management, you have to be very good on Bloomberg. Is there, is there uh, something that you need to master, a software or something else that you need to master in private banking spe- so specifically? If, if you're going to go into private banking in Europe, I would say get the CFA, or like, you don't have to master it, but like at least doing CFA level one or um, or at least, or you don't have to do the CFA if you don't want to, but I really think it's not going to hurt. Um, but I would say, because at least um, that's going to, you know, make you happy for the recruiter. You don't really need to hone, like you don't need to know Excel, but in the United States, if you're going to become a financial advisor, you should get the CFP. Because that's going to help you understand the tax law of the United States, how investments work in the U.S., estate planning in the U.S. So I would say, like, you should get the CFP if you want to become a financial advisor and cater to clients, because that's what recruiters are looking for, because that's what clients are looking for. So you need to always think in terms of the client. What do they want? They want to know that you know your stuff, 
and that you know holistically how to make sure that they're protected and they have a strategy. Okay, okay. So um, I was wondering, in private banking, uh, when it comes to promotions and so on, are they looking at your sales skills or do you need to have a different set of skills in order to become a manager rather than just a salesperson? Very simple. In private banking, the more money you manage, the higher your, your career is going to, like the more money you're going to make. So I more, like when I was in private banking, like we had people that managed, you know, 20 million, like literally financial advisors that manage, I don't know, $10 million, $20 million, or like 30 million was pretty much the minimum, $30 million and other financial advisors that managed billions of dollars. And the, 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 financial advisors that manage billions of dollars, they were the ones that um, had the most assistance, the nicer title, they had a bigger cut of the revenue that they were bringing in. Um, so you'll get more perks. Like at the end of the day, they don't care as long as you can bring in the money. <laughs> like, that's what okay. matters. Okay, okay, okay. So how do the tasks, your day-to-day -day tasks change as you become a manager? What are the kind of things that you don't have to do um, as a salesperson at, at your starting point that you need to, need to do as a manager? Yeah, so when you're starting out, right, you're going to be the, everyone. Like you're going to be cold calling, you're going to be catering, opening bank accounts, you're going to be catering to the client. Um, however, as a manager, you're going to be um, just really managing the financial advisors and, or, and, and maybe not even like doing the day-to-day -day operations, but you'll have assistants and people under you that are going to be the ones managing the, the clients and the money. Um, so as a manager, you need to know, especially as a financial advisor, you need to know, okay, how can I make these assistants um, cater to my clients better and want to and want to grow my business so typically what I saw a lot of the best financial advisors do is they would give like say a financial advisor would give like 20 percent of their revenue that he brought in so say that he brought a million dollars a year um no so this financial advisor in particular he brought you know 10 million dollars a year he kept half of it let's just say he kept half and then one so he kept five million and then he gave away one million to his assistants. So he had he had like three or four different assistants. So he would give the one million dollars. So it was a way to align his practice for the assistants. So obviously these assistants were making you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, which is unheard of. But it was a way for the financial advisor to be more with like trying to get more clients and be a salesperson while the, the assistants were catering to the clients in the day-to-day -day operations. Okay, okay. So I was just wondering, last thing before, well, before I'm done with the, with the questions, is um, what are the tools that you, that you use to do your research on, for example, singular stocks? Because probably in private banking, you still have the, either Bloomberg or Refinitiv and so on. What are the best tools that a small for firm or somebody that wants to start a small firm can afford? Okay, totally. So um, when I first started my firm, um, I actually, uh, I used Charles Schwab and Charles Schwab actually has more uh, research, right? So we already have more uh, Morningstar research. I use personally, I'm more of a growth oriented investor. Um, and if you ever see me speak, it's because like I buy high quality companies that are growing. So you'll never, I'm not, I have more of like the Phil Fisher mentality in the sense that I'm not going to buy a stock just because it's cheap. I'm going to buy a stock that I believe has a, a possibility to differentiate itself and be a, um, a great client. So I personally use Investors Business Daily as my, um, my, a lot of my research. I use MarketSmith. It's a lot cheaper than Bloomberg. It's about $150 a month. Um, and it's a really good way for you to look into, um, like get a good glimpse quickly as to, the, as, to, as to the research. So I use MarketSmith. I really like it. And I do look, because I look at both 
um, fundamentals, I use Morningstar. And then for technicals and more, I use MarketSmith. Okay. So that was really, really good. I think it will be very helpful to a lot of people. So thank you for being with us. If you have anything else you want to share, uh, you're welcome to do so. If not, I really want to thank you for, for your time. Totally. And if any of your viewers um, want to learn you know, maybe how to start a firm, uh, you know, an RIA or how to start your own financial advisory firm, reach out. I'm thinking of doing some videos. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can reach out to me if you want to speak. Um, I'm, I'm always here. So. Okay. Thank you a lot. Of course, the, the link is going to be in the description for your, for your channel. So thank you for being with us. Um, I'm Giacomo. This is Hustle Hub. See you next time. Thank you, Giacomo.